The introduction this morning will be given by one of the most active members of our committee, Mary Temple. Dr. Gary Culbert was born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. He's married, his wife Sandy is our guest today. They have two children, Emily, who was named after Emily Dickinson, and John. He received his BA from St. Olaf College and is a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He received his MA from the University of Chicago and his PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He was assistant professor of English at the University of Washington from 1972 to 1981. He is currently employed at Eastside Catholic High School, Bellevue, Washington. His academic specialty is American literature, 19th century, popular literature, English language, Shakespeare, etc. He has published in the Walt Whitman Review, the weekly Northwest Book Arts. Dr. Culbert, added this coin note to his biography. Feel free to embellish with pleasant fictions. <laughs> <laughs> fictions, fiddlesticks. Why resort to fictions when the truth is so much more interesting and exciting? Classical literature has had the pleasure of having had Dr. Culbert as its teacher for at least one series of lectures every year for the past six years. This fall, he taught one three-week session on Hardy, Hopkins, and Hausman. And this spring in April, he will have three sessions on Walt Whitman. Somehow, we members of classical literature felt selfish and decided that other members of the Women's University Club should have the opportunity to hear Dr. Culver. So we asked our guest today to review a book for us. Now, when you hear Dr. Culver review, Practical History Selected Essays by Barbara Tuckman. All of you non-members of classical literature will know what you have been missing. Dr. Culbert. Thank you, Mary. Am I audible now to you? No? Twist this around. How about now? Is that better? Okay. I feel like a member of this club. I've been around so long, but never down here. Not yet. All right. Twist this to me. How's that? Is that better? Okay. You can't pull up. How about this? Is that better? Okay. I'm going to move this over here then. Talk right into it. They gave me a free choice this fall. Uh, they said they'd like me to review something, and I had just bought Barbara Tuckman's new book of collected essays called Practicing History. I think probably uh, collected essays are near to the bottom of the total sales of books that people might want to publish. Uh, what writers do is go back into their production and pull out what they've published over the last 10 years and get a free title out of it. Uh, usually, people are not interested in them. They want the real thing. But I was very uh, interested in this because I had thought for years that Barbara Tuckman was probably the most interesting historian writing today. She's got enough credit to her history to make it uh, prove besides by my own preference. She has a marvelous book on pre-World War I Western civilization called The Proud Tower, which some of you may have read years ago. Another very good book on the beginning of World War I called The Guns of August. She's got a book which won major awards called Still Well in the American Experience in China, and a book that I believe Mary reviewed for you a year or so ago called The Distant Mirror. Barbara Tuckman is not an academic, however, and if there's any irritation in this book of collected essays, it's her insistence on reminding us that she really doesn't have a PhD and she's very different. But what she's really trying to say is that the difference is the quality, and I'm almost convinced of that myself. So I bought this book and sat down to read it and decided I might as well make a little money on it myself when Mary said, would you like to review something good? And as I read it, I was convinced that it's exactly what I want to uh, recommend to you. Uh, the danger with essays, and I think any of you have encountered this, if you've read over the years, is that uh, when you pick up a book of essays, you take your chance. Right? You like essay number three and number eight, can't stand number four and number two and number eight and number 18. And I find that when I'm reading a book of essays, I come across one that's two-thirds of the way through, and then I stop reading the book. And heaven knows what I missed. Uh, 
It's a grab bag, traditionally, right? Well, this book is a grab bag in a sense. That is, it's, it's a series of essays published from roughly 18, 1935 to 1980. Uh, they cover a wide range of her historical interests in, uh, in the periodicals such as the, the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Review of Books, that kind of essay. They include Nixon and Mao and uh, Woodrow Wilson and uh, you name it, uh, her, her grandfather, Morgenthau. Uh, they, incur, they include essays on Israel, other, uh, other t topics that reach her interest and never turn into books. She was unwilling to uh, abandon them. But when she found that, that she had the task of making a collected series of essays, she decided to give the book some shape. And what I would want to argue to you is that this book probably will give you one of the most interesting approaches, if you could call it that, to the way historian, a historian thinks, the way she writes, what it means to be a historian. The book is divided up into three parts. And the first part is uh, called The Craft. It includes uh, about eight or nine essays with titles like In Search of History, When Does History Happen, History by the Ounce, The Historian as Artist. That is, their broad, general considerations written for one reason or another by Barbara Tuckman about what it means to her to be a historian, why she became one. Then she gives you a middle section, which are independent essays, uh, no relationship to them at all. It's called the yield. In other words, the craft tells you how she approaches history as a writer. The yield gives you some samples of what the product is when you're a historian. Uh, the titles are like this, Japan, a clinical note, Campaign Train, What Madrid Reads, The Final Solution, Israel, Land of Unlimited Opportunities, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson on Freud's Couch. That's a good one. Uh, uh, these are, are, I think, randomly interesting. I found, for example, that uh, the essays on Israel were less interesting to me, um, though they were interesting. But they were less interesting than, say, the essay on Mao and the essay on Wilson, which I'll read to you, uh, from to you uh, shortly. Uh, there were a few that I wasn't interested in at all, but I was getting a sense that it was important to me to read these so I could see what made The Proud Tower, The Guns of August, so good, so fascinating. And I think I know, because she's telling me. The last section in the book is called Learning from History, and it doesn't quite fit. Even the title is not parallel. If I were teaching her in a writing class, I'd not correct that. But what she's doing is asking what it means to be a historian and to see history and then to apply it. That is, what she's saying is, what can history do for the future? Where can you go from that? And she has uh, an equivocal response to that, I think, because there's no way of making any, any proof that you can work to the future, in spite of what uh, Marx and Lenin felt. Um, what I want to do is to read to you some passages from this, give you a sense of her voice. She's a very good writer, vastly better than a historian has a right to be, it seems to me. And uh, her personality comes through strongly and then give you a, a sense that when you, if you find this book interesting, come to it, you'll see it as a whole book rather than just a random, a random collection. Uh, I, I wish she hadn't said selected essays on the title page. I wish all she called it was practicing history because that's the real, the real um, meat of this essay. Before I, I start talking about that, I want to pass on a, 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 a humorous element. Uh, when I picked the book up first, I saw it in the university bookstore, and uh, I was immediately uh, intrigued by it. So I opened it up, and I came across something you never see anymore in books. And it's an errata slip. Uh, in the 18th century and earlier, uh, books frequently had them because publishers fixed up their errors. But in the 20th century, they don't bother to fix up their errors. So you never see errata slips anymore. Uh, not that books are perfect. They just don't care. But this one was a good one. And I started reading it and being a, an American liter literature specialist, I started laughing out loud and humiliating myself in the bookstore. Uh, I want to read it to you just to share it. Most of these two poems, which are, are the problem in the book, are poems that most of you should remember. The erratus that goes like this. In the two stanzas quoted on page 17, the first from a poem by Emerson, the second from one by Pohl, who uh, uh, Emerson hated Pohl, by the way. <laughs> the third line of each was inadvertently transposed from one to the other. The stanzas should read as follows. Uh, the first one is Emerson's on Concord Bridge, and the stanza she quotes is this. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled, here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world, right? Everybody knows that. The, uh, the uh, 
whole poem is his poem to Helen, which is his most classically beautiful poem, uh, a wonderful piece, surprisingly, from that poet. On desperate seas long walk to roam, thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face, thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. You all remember that too, I'm sure. Well, this is what uh, came up. If, uh, if Barbara Tuckman is vulnerable to ulcers, this must have given her a terrible ulcer. She's talking about, in writing, the importance, the, the vast importance of using real words, short words, not, not using Latin at language just to impress your reader. She says, in my opinion, short words are always preferable to long ones. The fewer syllables, the better. And monosyllables, beautiful and pure, like bread and sun and grass, are the best of all. Emerson, using almost entirely one-syllable words, wrote what I believe are among the finest lines in English. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Thy naiad airs have brought me home and fired the shot heard round the world. <laughs> then it gets worse. Uh, out, of the, out of 28 words, 24 are monosyllables. It is English at its purest, though hardly characteristic of its author. Or take this. On desperate seas, long want to roam, thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face. Here once the embattled farmers <laughs> stood <laughs> to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. And then she says, imagine how it must feel to have composed those lines. <laughs> oh, well, you see why I made a fool of myself in public. Okay, let me uh, give you a sample of what she's doing in, in this book. She starts out in her first essays by talking about where she came from as a young woman. Uh, males dominate the field of history, as you know. But she comes from a fairly well-to-do family, a uh, New York family. And in her first essay, she talks about the spirit she got by going to the library for the t first time. She's talking about the, the Widener Library. And I thought I would give you a sense of her voice by reading you a couple of paragraphs. So you can hear what she's saying. Uh, moving her on. This is a, a, the uh, BA degree that she's working on, and I think it's at, where is the Widener? Uh, Columbia? Harvard. Harvard, right. That's right. Remember that, because the fellow who, who uh, there's a story about a famous man who, was, who donated, father donated thousands of dollars to the Widener, who went down on the Titanic. Did you know about that? And he, he had gone to uh, England and bought one of the one or two copies in existence of Francis Bacon's essays, and he put it in his pocket and he said, if the Titanic goes down, this is going down with me. It's a terrible loss of a book. <laughs> All right, here's, a, here's Barbara Tuckman. Now, I'm serious now. It's a nice piece. Uh, I found it uh, very attractive and reminded me of my first days at the University of Chicago when I went into their library for the first time and found one of those buildings where books are everywhere under the stairs and an incredible amount of knowledge, excitement, inspiration available to a student who's avid for learning. In the process of doing my own thesis, not for a PhD, because I never took a graduate degree, but just my undergraduate honors thesis, the single most formative experience in my career took place. It was not a tutor or a teacher or a fellow student or a great book or the shiny example of some famous visiting lecturer like Sir Charles Webster, for instance, brilliant as he was. It was the stacks of the Widener. They were my Achilles bathtub, my burning bush, my dish of mold where I found my personal penicillin. I was allowed to have as my own one of those little cubicles with a table under a window, queerly called, as I have since learned, carols, a word I never knew when I sat in one. Mine was deep in among the 942 Fs, British history, that is. And I could roam at liberty through the rich stacks, taking whatever I could. The experience was marvelous, a word I use in its exact sense, meaning full of marvels. The happiest days of my intellectual life, when I began, until I began writing history, again some 15 years later, were spent in the stacks at Widener. My daughter Lucy, class of 61, once said to me, that she could not enter the labyrinth of Widener's stacks without feeling that she ought to carry a compass, a sandwich, and a whistle. I, too, was never altogether sure I could find the way out, but I was blissful as a cow put to graze in a field of fresh clover, 
and would not have cared if I had been locked in for the night. Once I stayed so late that I came out after dark, long after the dinner hour at the dorm, and found to my horror that I had, that I had only a nickel in my purse. The weather was freezing and I was very hungry. I could not decide whether to spend the nickel on a chocolate bar and walk home in the cold, or take the Mass Avenue trolley and go home hungry. This story ends like the lady and the tiger, because although I uh, remember the agony of having to choose, I cannot remember how it came out. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to read that to you off the bat to show that uh, if, your, if your memory from college of history is of dry academic voices, of boring old men mumbling into their beards, uh, you won't find that here, for the most part. That is, her voice is a very vivid one. She's involved. She's, a, she's an active writer. And you notice there's no pomposity there, right, except for her pointing out that she never got her PhD, which is an inversion of pomposity. Uh, it's an extremely readable voice. And Barbara Tuckman, I think, infuses that in almost all of her work. Of all historians, she's the one that the ordinary, intelligent, educated reader, I think, will find uh, attractive. Now, let's talk a little bit about what history means to her as she talks about this in her in her book of essays. What are the duties of a historian? I, I admire this because I think she really is a, uh, a literary person at heart. She says the writer of history, I believe, has a number of duties vis-a-vis -vis the reader. If he wants to keep him reading. I have read a lot of history books where the historian doing the writing didn't know somebody was going to be reading a book and didn't care. Right? And she says right off the bat that the first role or the first awareness of a, of a historian or any writer is that you remember somebody should want to read what you have written. That's a crucial point. Well, what is, what is the historian to do? The first is to distill. He must do the preliminary work for the reader. Assemble the information. Make sense of it. Select the essential. Discard the irrelevant. Above all, discard the irrelevant and put the rest together so that it forms a developing dramatic narrative. Narrative, it has been said, is the lifeblood of history. To offer a mass of undigested facts, of names not identified and places not located, is of no use to the reader. It's simple laziness on the part of the author, or pedantry, to show how much he has read. To discard the unnecessary requires courage and also extra work, as exemplified by Pascal's effort to explain an idea to a friend in a letter, which rambled on for pages, and ended, I am sorry to have wearied you with so long a letter, but I did not have time to write you a short one. <laughs> the historian is continually being beguiled down fascinating byways and sidetracks at the art of writing. The test of the artist is to resist the beguilement and cleave to the subject. Should the historian be an artist? Certainly a conscious art should be part of his equipment. Macaulay describes him as half poet, half philosopher. I do not aspire to either of those heights. I think of myself as a storyteller, a narrator who deals in true stories, not fiction. The distinction is not one of relative values. It is simply that history interests me more than fiction. I agree with Leopold von Ranke, the great 19th century German historian who said that when he compared the portrait of Louis the XI in Scott's Quentin Durward with the portrait of the same king in the memoirs of Philippe de Comines, Louis' ministers, he said the truth more interesting and more beautiful than romance. It was Ranke, too, who set the historian's task to find out, wie es eigentlich gewesen ist, what really happened, or literally, how it really was. His goal is one that will remain forever, just beyond our grasp, for reasons I explained in a note on sources in the Guns of August, a paragraph that no one ever reads, but I think is the best thing in the book. Summarized, the reasons are that we who write about the past we're not there. We can never be certain that we have recaptured it as it really was. But the least we can do is to stay within the evidence. I do not invent anything, even the weather. One of my readers told me he particularly liked a passage in the guns which tells how the British Army landed in France and how on that afternoon there was a sound of summer thunder in the air and the sun went down in a blood-red glow. He thought it an artistic touch of doom. But the fact is, it was true. I found it in the memoirs of a British officer who landed on that day and heard the thunder and saw the blood-red sunset. The art, if any, consisted only in selecting it and ultimately using it in the right place. 
I like that. It's good writing, as you can see. I think she modulates her voice wonderfully. She tells me intellectual and academic things and then keeps, me, keeps reminding me as I read that she's speaking to me as a person. And, and her voice, the drop down into the informal, is marvelous and keeps the, keeps the reader involved, especially somebody like myself, who is not a professional historian, a reader of histories, just the opposite. Now, she's given, a, given the game away, and much of this opening section of the book has to do with something you see happening in here. She is saying that what her job is as a historian is to keep an eye on the details. Right? She says history comes from putting together facts, details, truths, doing it in, a, in an artistic fashion and in such a way that the reality, the interior reality of an experience becomes visible. The trouble with any historian, that is the problem with any historian, the task, is that what he's given as a researcher is nothing more than details, uh, right? We know this ourselves, that we could write whole books on what we had for breakfast for 20, 20 years, right? It wouldn't create a very interesting biography. Finding the breakfast that made the difference is the hard part. And Barbara Tuckman is well aware of that crucial point. She saw, you see, in the episode I just read, that the true fact, is there such a thing as a false fact? That the fact of the blood-red sunset not the invention of it, was a way of giving a quality of truth to the experience of the war which was coming in a very short time to the men who would be dying. It's, it's putting these facts next to, next to each other that tells the reader and the historian why things happen. And what most of us read history for is to see why, right? To give structure to the unstructured quality of one day following another day. Uh, we would like to know why we got into Vietnam. But the only way we can find that out is to give ourselves the distance and the time to look at the facts to find out what was being done by the people involved. If the, if the historian will submit himself to his material instead of trying to impose himself on his material, then the material will ultimately speak to him and supply the answers. If she has a cause or a vendetta or whatever you'd like to call, call it here, an opponent, it becomes evident very quickly in his opening essays that it is the academic historian who imposes the facts, who imposes on the facts, the theories of his own history. Uh, Toynbee is her bete noir if she has one. She can't stand people who have theories of how people work and then who go back into history and pick the details to prove it. Uh, she would not have much uh, time for Marxist history either, as you can imagine, because what you do is take a structure and then fit, right? She never uses the phrase, but I was waiting for her to talk about the Procrustean bed, right? Where you have a bed and you cut your uh, visitors uh, short to fit the bed or stretch them to fit the bed, but you always have your visitors fit the bed. That's her enemy in history. She, she says what history is, is the historian opening himself passive to the facts and letting the truth come out of its own accord. She says, it has happened to me more than once. In somebody's memoirs, I found that the Grand Duke Nicholas wept when he was named Russian Commander-in-Chief in 1914. Because, said the memoirist, he felt inadequate for the job. That sounded to me like one of those bits of malice which one has to watch out for in contemporary observers. It did not ring true. The Grand Duke was said to be the only man in the royal family. He was known for his exceedingly tough manners, was admired by the common soldier and feared at court. I did not believe he felt inadequate, but then why should he weep? I could have left out this bit of information, but I did not want to. I wanted to find the explanation that would make it fit. Leaving things out because they do not fit is writing fiction not history. I carried the note about the Grand Duke around with me for days, worrying about it. Then I remembered other tears. I went through my notes and found an account of Churchill weeping, and also Messie Me, the French war minister. All at once I understood that it was not the individuals, but the times that were the stuff for tears. My next sentence almost wrote itself. There was an aura about 1914 that caused those who sensed it to shiver for mankind. Afterward, I realized that this sentence expressed why I had wanted to write the book in the first place. The why, you see, had emerged all by itself. Marvelous paragraph, as you can see. Uh, 
one minor detail. Why in the world would a tough male like the Grand Duke of Russia cry? Men don't cry. And if you recall, if you read the book, you recall that there is this tremendous aura of sadness about the book as you watch 19th century civilization ready to disrupt and uh, create the world we live in now. It's a very nice passage. It's detail, in other words, that Barbara Tuckman says makes history and makes history readable, not theory. It's bringing alive the events of the day. In another essay, she says this. At a party given for its reopening last year, the Museum of Modern Art in New York served champagne to 5,000 guests. An alert reporter for the Times, Charlotte Curtis, noted that there were 80 cases, which she informed her readers amounted to 960 bottles or 7,683-ounce drinks. Somehow, through this detail, the museum's party at once becomes alive, a fashionable New York occasion. One sees the crush, the women eyeing each other's clothes, the exchange of greetings, and feels the gratifying sense of elegance and importance imparted by champagne, even if at one and a half drinks per person it was not on an exactly riotous scale. <laughs> All this is conveyed by Miss Curtis' detail. It is, I think, the way history as well as journalism should be written. It is what Puba in the Mikado meant when telling how the victim's head stood on its neck and bowed three times to him at the execution of Nanki Pu. He added that this was corroborative detail intended to give artistic verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. Not that Miss Curtis' narrative was either bald or unconvincing, but what made it excel, made it vivid and memorable, was her use of corroborative detail as an opening paragraph to History by the Ounce. It reminds me of, a, of, a detail, of the detail in The Great Gatsby, if you remember the novel by F. Scott Fitzgerald, where he's describing Gatsby's world, and he says that uh, every uh, is it Saturday morning, crates of oranges are brought to the house. And there's a machine in that house that Gatsby owns, which if a butler pushes his thumb 200 times an hour, will turn those oranges, 200 oranges an hour, into orange juice. And I tell my students when I teach that book, that's all you need to know about Gatsby, right? He has a machine and a butler and a button. And you push that button. And that's, that's the world, isn't it? That's Gatsby's world. Ex 1920s excess. She knows this in terms of history. But she goes on. Puba's statement of the case establishes him in my estimate as a major historian, or at least as the formulator of a major principle of historiography. Now watch, this is very sneaky on her part. You're reading that, and all of a sudden she throws a word like historiography at you. Most of us don't say that word 10 times in a life, but she's actually teaching us an academic and very abstract theoretical term and giving us a way of remembering it. Curious. True, he invented his corroborative detail, which is cheating if you are a historian and fiction if you're not. Nevertheless, what counts is his recognition of his importance, of its importance. He knew that it supplies verisimilitude, that without it, a narrative is bald and unconvincing. Neither he nor I, of course, discovered the principle. Historians have for long made use of it, beginning with Thucydides, who insisted on details of topography, the appearance of cities, localities, the description of rivers and harbors, the peculiar features of seas and countries and their relative distances. You notice what he does, what she's doing? She moves from Gilbert and Sullivan back to Thucydides to support her case. She starts out with something trivial, how much champagne was drunk at a New York cocktail party, and ends up with one of the major enunciations of histori histo what was that word? Histo historiography, right? From one of the major antique historians, ancient historians. Well, this is Barbara Tuckman setting up her code in a series of essays which, though they do not relate one into another, relate one to another marvelously. And, uh, and I want to give you an example, though time is flying, of, uh, of how this works in, uh, in some of the specific, uh, uh, specific essays that are in the middle of the book. One short quotation before I move into the middle of the book. She's talking here about the task of the historian, which is to tell what human history is about and what the forces are that drive us. Okay. Uh, I don't want to skip over this because it, it is the crucial element. That is, history is not the details. It's what the details tell you about the interior 
of human life, if that makes sense. I'm afraid I would have left you thinking only details, but no, it's the interior. The task that evolves upon historians is to tell what human history is about and what are the forces that do drive us. That is not to say that history excludes the squalid and depraved, but being concerned as it is with reality and subject as it is to certain disciplines, it deals with these in proportion to the whole. Historians start with a great advantage over fiction in that our characters being public are invested with power to affect destiny. They are captains and kings, saints and fanatics, traitors, rogues and villains, pathfinders and explorers, thinkers and creators, even occasionally heroes. They are significant, if not necessarily admirable, they may be evil or corrupt or mad or stupid or even stuffed shirts, but at least by virtue of circumstance or chance or office or character, they matter. They are the actors, not the acted upon, and are consequently that much more interesting. Readers want to see man shaping his history, or at least struggling with it. And this is the stuff of history. They want to know how things happened, why they happened, and particularly what they themselves have lived through, just as after a record heat or heavy snow, the first thing one turns to in the morning paper is the account of yesterday's weather. And now more than ever, when man's place in the world has never been so subject to question, when alienation is the prevailing word, the public also hopes to find some guidelines to destiny, some pattern or meaning to our presence on this whirling globe. Whether or not as individuals, historians believe in one pattern or another, or some of us in none, the evidence we have to present provides reassurance in showing that man has gone through his dark ages before. Okay, there she is setting up her code, how she does it, and what she expects to come of it, and why you should read history. Me too. Let me give you an example of what this looks like when she's applying it to a particular task. I thought uh, I picked up a couple of them, but I guess I'll do only one. Uh, this is from Woodrow Wilson on Freud's couch. This is a particularly nice essay because she's really a testy. She doesn't like at all uh, what these people do to Wilson. Uh, in particular, she doesn't like how they overextend themselves. Uh, she uh, knows enough to uh, not to give away complete uh, balance, shall we say. And so she allows the Freudian critic, Freudian biographer and historian, to say, yes, uh, Freudian uh, criticism or psychology or psychiatry is useful in describing people's minds. But when you use it, uh, as these people do, uh, your ire starts rising. Uh, she feels that they have gone way beyond their privilege and their right. And uh, and I could uh, I was very uh, much enjoying feeling her outrage. I like to feel outraged. And in a sense, I think they have done, if she's right, though I haven't read the book, a uh, dishonor to Wilson. And uh, there's nothing like defending someone's honor to make you feel good. And this is what she's doing. So let me read to you a middle of this and see if you can see how uh, the detail, uh, the, the, the way she looks at the interior of people. Uh, and uh, her respect for the human spirit comes through here. This is what she says they're doing. Briefly, the analysis discovers a man in whom manifest submissiveness toward his father warred with unconscious hostility, which had to find release and acted out hostility toward substitute father figures, such as Dean West at Princeton and Senator Lodge, while the submissiveness had to be compensated by a torturing superego whose excessive demands required of him such godlike achievements that no actual accomplishment could satisfy it. On the jangling Freudian battlefield of the id, see how she's uh, twisting our response to this, right? Uh, the conflict rages in many forms. There are the complicated shapes of narcissism, identification with a father, a Presbyterian minister, becoming identification with God, and conversely, as little Tommy Wilson with Jesus. There are over-devoted friendships with small, slight sun figures, given tumulty house, always ending in a sense of betrayal. There is identification with the mother, prompting or requiring feminine concessions and submissions to father figures in the case of Lloyd George and Clemenceau. There are the compulsions to repeat, and overall, the unrelenting superego. Born of his deep inferiority as a small child vis-a-vis -vis his father, which itself was part cause and part, of, part effect of the startling and almost unbelievable circumstance that Wilson did not learn the alphabet until the age of nine, or read easily until 11. As she even here, you see, she's got her eye open for the odd fact that sticks in your mind. I think I, I admire Wilson, always have, um, but I'll never forget that he didn't read until he was nine <laughs> or 11. Um, his tyrannical superego could never be satisfied with any success. 
No rung up the ladder was high enough, not even presidency of the United States. He had to become savior of the world. The League of Nations was to be the grail, proof of his title as savior. The treaties and equities did not matter as long as it embodied the League, for the existence of the League would solve all problems. The League was the rationalization which made it possible for him to believe he had indeed saved the world. She's quoting me, the author here. Wilson had to gain the League to save his soul. Yet in the fight with Lodge, he himself set up the conditions which made the gain impossible. Here she's referring to the failure of Wilson to succeed in establishing the United States participation in the, in the uh, League of Nations. Um, in Freudian terms, this becomes the death wish, which to this reviewer seems super erogatory. I like that. See, she can whip out a big word and hit them with one in return, see, if she wants to. For the battle with his father in the shape of Lodge, plus the demands of his superego and the terrible truth in his heart that the treaty, even including the League, was not the peace he had promised the world, was enough to destroy any man. On October 2nd, 1919, came the paralytic stroke by thrombosis in the brain, even as 13 years earlier, in the midst of his frenzied struggle with West at Princeton, his arteries raced with the bursting of a blood vessel in his eye. Thus foreshortened, the analysis is less persuasive than in the book, where all the details, examples, and corroborative ev evidence from episode to episode build up an inherent logic which has the same quality as certain dream interpretations. When they are right, they fit, and one knows it at once. Otherwise, no bell rings. The bell rings here. One feels that Wilson himself, so like a queer dream, is explained. In other words, she's giving the authors some credit. Certain aspects seem slighted. For one, the fact of Wilson's late reading, whose repercussions for a mentally gifted child in an intellectual family could not fail to have been devastating, and for another, oddly enough, Wilson's relations with women. The easy, ref the easy references to mother identification and to his wives as mother substitutes are coupled with a flat statement that until the first Mrs. Wilson's death, Wilson had not the slightest sexual interest in any other woman. I am perfectly prepared to believe it, but to quote my own marginal notes at this point, how on earth do they know? <laughs> what is the evidence for our proof of this negative? The book, incidentally, is without notes or references of any kind, and quotations are given without attribution. As regards the second Mrs. Wilson, let us content ourselves, the authors say airily, that Wilson again found a mother's breast on which to rest. In view of uh, rather more genial aspects of this, in, in view of rather more genial aspects of this relationships not mentioned in this book, including the fact that Wilson habitually referred to his second wife as little girl, the author's reliance on mother seems a bit high. <laughs> you know, she can use uh, her own voice and, and really devastate uh, the pomposity of the person she's uh, she's reading and talking about here. It goes on in, the, in a, an even more interesting way. She comes, or comes around to it like this at the end. And she agrees that a major problem in, in Wilson's uh, life was, uh, was his inability to achieve what he wanted. He did fail to make the League of Nations a powerful uh, international body, and he wanted that glory. But her summary is going to be broader. It was not only that Wilson's psyche that failed in this situation, not uh, his fault alone, nor his fault alone, that the Treaty of Versailles was less than ideal. The fault was humanity's. It could have sufficed the authors to have analyzed the nature of Wilson's neuroses, which they have done brilliantly and convincingly. It was not necessary to have claimed it as the historical cause of what they see as the evil peace of Versailles. They are addicted to the oversimplified single explanation of great events. There was in Bullet, writes his fellow New Dealer, Raymond Molle, a deep, somewhat disturbing strain of romanticism. As ambassador, he saw foreign affairs as full of lights and shadows, plots and counterplots, villains and a, a few heroes. A dangerous state of mind, if not subjected to the quieting influence of some controlling authority. It can be dangerous to the historian as well as the ambassador. Now, what I want you to see is that Barbara Tuckman is the kind of writer, when she's writing about Wilson here, who's going to temperamentally refuse to allow the kind of thesis that the book is going to argue, that in this man, and in his psycho psycho psychosis, in his mother complex, is the reason for the massive international failure of the League of Nations, and heaven knows World War II, three and four probably as well. She believes strongly in the important human element in history. And as she writes about history, she looks at the ordinary man often who's trapped. The reason I'm not going to read to you from um, if Mao had come to Washington, which is another essay I liked a lot. But what she says in that essay is that there has now become evidence 
that uh, Mao and uh, Zhou Enlai, yeah, about 1942 or 43, both offered to come to Washington and to meet with President Roosevelt. And what she does in that essay is say, imagine what would have happened had the United States been able or willing to see the inevitability of the communist uh, victory in China and not tied itself to the nationalist Chinese. Uh, the Cold War, the relationship with China for the last 25 years, everything would have been changed. I mean, uh, international history would have made a, major, uh, made a major turning point at that time. The reason we did not, one of the reasons we did not accept the offer was the United States ambassador to China in the 1940s, a man named Hurley, who in her research comes across as a narrow-minded, pompous, egocentric man, so, I hate to use the word, but stupid, that he couldn't see any other world than the one he had come preconceived with to China. And so what she does is set up a curious essay, it's a really nice piece, where you ask yourself, is it possible that one man, Ambassador Hurley, with no skills, right? and we know that if you've read uh, the American experience in China, there were other people who were not so narrow, Stilwell himself being one of them. Uh, if one man could have changed history as radically as he did, she comes off with a, a, balanced, uh, a balanced conclusion, I think. Yes, Hurley had a tremendous influence. But as you see here, her tendency is to see the way human beings create, the influence they have, and then pull back and point out that this is really a consequence of all kinds of things including, if you like, President Roosevelt's illness, right? one after another. So reading Tuckman in history is seeing individuals in action and then pulling back to see the massive interaction of people, motives, ideas, weather, you name it, that creates history.